Hello, everyone. Uh, my, my title is Kolmog or Way to the International Mathematical Scene. Just a little prehistory. Uh, Slava invited me to give a talk at that seminar when I told Slava that I'm working on a paper on Kolmogorov. And my paper is Kolmogorov, in fact, concerns rather a specific topic. It's uh, about his uh, major logical paper published in 1932 on uh, calculus of problem and uh, his engagement with uh, Arendt Heiting. Uh, yeah, but just for that occasion, I uh, decided to broaden the scope, which is kind of risky that I learn, uh, know less, of course, what is around my research, my, my narrow research interest, but I still to take uh, taking this risk because I think that would be more appropriate for, for the, the seminar and this audience. And also Slava um, asked me uh, to reflect on a particular paper by Mikhail Sokolov and Cyril Titaev published in uh, Anthropological Forum. This is a relatively new journal published since 2004. Mm, yeah, and actually when I just try to, to, to find precise reference, I discovered that this journal has a rather peculiar, uh, how say, ed editorial policy. It publishes in two separate series, one of which is uh, in Russian and the other in English. And I think it's a little bit reflect what Mikhail Sokolov and Cyril Titaev uh, <laughs> propose in their, in their paper. Uh, so the, the plan of the talk is this. I very briefly, very briefly overview uh, the paper then I uh, kind of use it as a framework to present some historical material concerning early, uh, uh, early uh, stage of uh, Kalmagorov's career. And then I come back to conclusion and coming back again to, to the paper. Okay, so what uh, this paper uh, proposes, I would describe as a imperial or colonial uh, model of uh, science, meaning how scientific community works globally. And uh, this basic assumption is that in this global scientific community, there exists a single, in fact, that's important that it's a single, I would call it metropole and multiple colonies, right? And actually the author's uh, attention is um, uh, first of all, on what happens in the colonies rather than in the metropole. So they stress that in the colonies, actors have a choice between two things. And first, kind of recognize the supremacy of the metropole. And uh, as you know, as a good local picking, uh, people serving the metropole, helping to exercise the power of a metropole over the given uh, province. This is one choice, and the other choice is uh, somehow resist uh, this power and develop what they call a native or ab aboriginal, tuzemne uh, in Russian uh, science, which is not recognized by the metropole and perhaps also not by other colonies. So just create kind of isolated scientific community there. People read each other, but it does not extend its uh, scope outside this uh, local community. That's uh, okay, not, not <laughs> particularly neutral, but uh, very short summary of the paper. And uh, I just before I expose my historical material, I would like to make some claims which I, I try to substantiate with the material. And I think that this colonial model perfectly reflects recent academic policies adopted by some progressive Russian academic institutions. First of all, I am thinking about Russian uh, uh, Moscow based and actually now also having a lot of branches in Russia, high school of economics. But I don't think that it uh, really accounts accurately for the structure of the global academic network, even if it still reflects some, some real feature and I would argue that they are kind of problematic features. 
Uh, and of course, it cannot really serve as a guide to historical research, but nevertheless, as I told already, it actually allows us to understand this uh, current academic policies and um, say discussion in today's Russia and also say in uh, Russian history in a way, right? Because for digging into history, we sh should start um, at the present stage anyway. So that's my very critical um, uh, say understanding of this paper. And now I turn to um, Andrei Nikolaevich Kalmagorov. I, I actually should say that even if some people notably uh, uh, not the, uh, 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 Cantor and uh, Graham, uh, already mentioned by, by Michelle in their book, actually they say that, actually according to some accounts, I, I, but I never came across it elsewhere, I must confess that Kalmogorov is counted as one of three greatest mathematician of uh, 20th century along with David Hilbert and uh, um, Henri Poincaré. And, uh, but still there is no actually comprehensive biography in any language, Russian or English or any other languages. There are a lot of work, there are kind of collections of papers even recently published on different aspects of his work, more historical, more theoretical. But I think if we compare the scholarship, which is done already for Hilbert, for Poincaré, of course, and if we take this assumption that this is a figure of uh, at least comparable importance, I think we really need much more scholarship. So, uh, so now I just going to make very, very short biographical facts. Basically, you find it more or less in Wikipedia or around. So he is born in the city of Tambov in a rather how say, uh, uh, special circumstances because his mother traveled from uh, a research place in Crimea to Yaroslavl. And so she gave birth of uh, Andre on her way and she died actually tragically um, during the birth. Um, and uh, father Nikolai Kataev was uh, uh, his name. Uh, he was a priest. And, and a very important uh, SR, a member of Social Revolutionary Party. And he took, say, very little part of uh, Andrei's upbringing. Ba basically, he brought him to Yaroslav, where both Marie and, and he lived. And he was adopted by Marie's sister Vera. And but by on the other hand, this Vera really did a lot for him and also for other children. She organized kind of homeschool. And in the, actually, she made it that uh, Andre entered rather important uh, Moscow gymnasium of the time. It was private gymnasium uh, uh, known as Eugenia Repman gymnasium. Her father, uh, Albert Repman, was a very interesting character. He worked in Polytechnical Museum in Moscow. He's actually, his father was uh, a Dutch and uh, his mother was French. And um, yeah, so it was an important family and that was a school where there were boys and girls together. There, that was unusual for the time. And moreover, they applied this um, kind of new methods where all the uh, students had to supervise younger students. I Somehow I, when I read about that, it rings a lot of bell because it's kind of similar of story of my grandmother who received uh, in a sense, more privileged, but also uh, say similar education. And the one practical result of this education that as I well know by my grandmother, they were absolutely fluent in German and French and say, uh, reluctantly, I would say use also English, which was in the system of education somehow imposed over uh, French, uh, uh, French, German, uh, Greek, and Latin. So people somehow were tired of languages unless those who were specifically interested in languages. So, so their English was less good at uh, French and German, but French and German were just almost like native languages. And that's exactly what 
apparently Kalmagorov had also on his evidences that I'm not going to bring now from 70s and so on. Yeah, in uh, uh, 1918, he plans to enter Moscow University. So he prepared to the university to entering exam, but because of revolution of this uh, uh, tumoral, uh, uh, political tumoral, he had actually worked a year as a construction worker on a railway, constructing railways from Moscow to Kazan. But nevertheless, he's actually enrolled into the university uh, kind of automatically. And he regretted <laughs> later that, the, he regretted in the sense that he really prepared very seriously uh, uh, for entering examination, but he was taking, uh, he was enrolled without exams in 1919. And then, then he actually, uh, okay, he somehow oscillated, this is very famous story between history and uh, uh, mathematics. One, perhaps everybody knows, but I think it's very somehow telling anecdote Then he made some also in, in achievement in history, but then he was criticized that a proof of historical claim that he made was not sufficient. Professor told him that he would need more than just one proof. And at that point, this is an anecdote that I, I didn't have a chance to meet um, Andrei Nikolaevich in, pers in person, but apparently he just repeated it many times in public. And he said, in, at that point, I just changed for or opted for science where one proof is sufficient. So it's kind of easier way. He started to do mathematics. And in 1921, he uh, finds a mistake in a lecture, no, no public lecture. It was just a university lecture, actually. Well, maybe I shouldn't call it public, of his uh, very famous professor, Nikolai Luzin. And he makes very soon uh, other important results. So Nikolai Luzin is a uh, very much impressed and uh, he invites him to this uh, community that he called uh, Lusitania. Uh, other members were, of course, Yegorov and uh, many, many others. And uh, uh, that was kind of very privileged circle around Luzin. He became actually one of, not founding member because he was young, he was invited, but nevertheless, say, of the first wave of uh, members very early the, the Lusitania I think officially it uh, starts in 1920 right and he published extensively and that's we'll see a little bit more details in a minute and uh, in uh, June 1930 to March uh, 31 he makes actually his first European trip uh, I'm still not was quite sure what was funding because the, the, I had some kind of conflicting evidences. So I'll try to find it out. I think it's not a big historical puzzle. But anyway, he visited Göttingen, which was kind of Mecca, mathematical Mecca of the time, and the Munich and Paris. And um, he meets in person David Hilbert, Amy Noether, uh, Richard Courant, uh, who later made the continued his. Uh, Career in the United States, Herman Weil, uh, Andre Lebeg, Emil Borel, and actually many other important people that just for the question for contacts and so on. And upon the return, he's appointed as a professor. I just stop here for this uh, basic biography because he, it was just the only beginning of his career. Uh, yeah, by the way, this uh, photo. Uh, with Alexandrov, that's his kind of almost long life partner. Uh, and that's another big story about their relationships that I'm not going to comment. But this photo I used for announcement on the post of this lecture, it's, it's uh, uh, a photo of this uh, pair of friends uh, during this very trip. Actually, they, they part of it, they, they traveled together, then they separated Alexander went to Princeton and then they continued exchange letters. 
so that, that was a really a lot, but I <laughs> try to, to stop here uh, this, uh, how say, biographical details and just look at publications. Uh, yeah, so this is a list of publication officially published some time ago. I think it's more or less full. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, and so so if you have this uh, colonial model in mind, I think first thing which looks striking, so you would expect that uh, the young researcher, mathematician, however, talent that first publishes somehow locally in Russian, right? And then continues. That's what I ironically called in my um, title, the way to international sin. But actually in case of Kalmar Gorov, we see something very different, right? Uh, he first uh, publishes in uh, this uh, uh, bulletin of uh, Polish, Academy of Science, I think that was in, in French and the whole issue in French. Then uh, he published another, and that is a really great paper with a very important result. <laughs> and uh, in the journal, I'll say a bit later, a couple of words about this journal. It was very recent, founded only in 1920. It exists today called Fundamenta Mathematica, it's a Polish journal. And actually it's the first uh, specialized mathematical journal. So the first journal in the, the world, which is not just on mathematic, general mathematics, but on specific mathematical topic, which is basically set theory foundations of mathematics. All right, and so uh, the same actually continues next year, again, Fundamenta Mathematica, and then all the Contre-Rendu Académie Science Paris. Uh, so it's kind of French a mathematical, it's not exactly a mathematical journal, but it's very, very also important place where people may publish. And actually his first Russian paper comes out in uh, 1925, so it's like fifth right publication in this absolute order, and that is actually a logical paper about, as we would today say, uh, law of excluded middle, which he publishes in in Russian. By the way, that was rather unfortunate uh, that it was in Russian because it's, it was basically the same result uh, obtained by Kurt Gödel in uh, 1930 about so-called uh, double negation translation of uh, uh, mm, between uh, intuitionistic and uh, classical logic. And actually uh, that continues more or less that way. I didn't try to put all bi biography, you see, so next year it's all, uh, uh, yeah, that's interesting also that his uh, joint publication with Hinch, it is in this Russian mathematical uh, Zbornik, but it's in German that time in German. So most of stuff is either in French, actually more in French or in uh, German, uh, uh, right? And again, uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, a kind of proceeding of Italian Academy, which again, still exists, still published, uh, right? And uh, actually we don't, yeah, again, mathematical Zbornik and uh, again, Comprendio Academy Science Paris. And uh, uh, right, I think only he, here it's uh, a kind of new uh, <laughs> uh, academic establishment, right? Uh, by, uh, of, uh, proceeding of communist academy that was created that time as a kind of counter balance to traditional academia. Yeah, and that's very interesting. That is actually his uh, probably uh, the only one really philosophical paper, very, very interesting. Now also translated into English in journal Nauchine Slova, like scientific word, uh, also in Russian. But you see, he publishes all, almost all his stuff in, uh, uh, he wrote and in different languages and with only some exceptions uh, in Russian. 
Uh, and actually, uh, it continues until late 30s when uh, publishing abroad becomes kind of politically unwelcomed. Okay. Uh, and still he continues to do that. Yeah, I think uh, exactly because uh, unlike say his professor Luzin, he uh, fully takes side of this uh, Soviet authorities, let's put it that way, right? Which of course, um, uh, which of course uh, reflected in his rather, I would say shameful behavior during this uh, uh, losing affair, right? He's still allowed to publish abroad, sufficiently less, but still. Then also he publishes in this, uh, uh, after the war, right? In uh, uh, so sort of communist in the Eastern Bloc countries, right? In Eastern Germany, in Poland a lot, right? But uh, yeah, so, so how we could uh, explain that, right? So it so far uh, doesn't fit at all this idea that people should come from national context to this uh, big international context. But I think uh, uh, I just try to say a couple of words very, very briefly, I don't have time, uh, about uh, say the whole business of uh, scientific publishing in Russia. Here we have a very clear start is a, a Commentary Academia Centarium Imperialis Petropolitane, which is a official kind of proceeding of Russian Academy of Sciences founded in 1724. And actually that was important, uh, important place, uh, uh, particularly in mathematics. Uh, due to the fact that they were lucky to get Leonard Euler, right? And actually his major publishing were made in this, uh, of course, not in Russian. I think Russian was never used here. It was mostly in Latin, uh, perhaps with, with some exceptions to, to German and French. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so basically here I just, to put it into the context, right? So I mentioned this academia uh, of uh, links. We, <laughs> which is the oldest of European academia, made, uh, we may say, by Italy, but just meaning that Italy didn't exist, right? Of course, at that time, in its modern as it form, right? <clears throat> A later followed. Académie Française, of course, it's 1634, Royal Society of London, uh, 1660, uh, German so-called Berlin Academy, Kyönglisch Preußische Academy, Der Wissenschaften in uh, 1700, made basically by Leibniz, and by the way, Peter the Great famously also consulted Leibniz. There is an exchange of letter between Peter and uh, Leibniz concerning establishment on Russian Academy. And uh, by the way, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which again still exists, even is maybe even less important, they say Russian Academy in Russia or moreover uh, French Academy in France, uh, but it still exists. And uh, characteristically it was founded during the war of independence. So it was just one of these first very important establishments of uh, new American uh, state. It also has its uh, journal, it's called Day Dallas, now I think uh, published by MIT. Uh, uh, so that was kind of typical pattern and you see Russia was um, somehow in, in the middle of this, it was not one of the first, it was not uh, the, 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 the last as American, perhaps there were some later academics, I didn't try to make this here full list. And and what is actually uh, seems to me kind of puzzling and impressive anyway, that those institutions have amazing stability, right? So they survive many political regime changes, crashes. No, I think the worst case of this Berlin Academy, which actually its existence today kind of questionable, uh, right? Because of second world war, obviously. Right, but still all these things still exist and still uh, kicking, <laughs> so so to speak, all of them. And this uh, first Russian mathematical journal, right? And that was actually the first Russian journal, specific mathematical journal, because before, say, 
mathematical stuff, also in Russian, by the way, was published either in this old uh, commentary and later by uh, some sort of, uh, today it's called Vestnik, like uh, edition of the university, right? The Russian university had and still has today, right? Just kind of uh, uh, proceedings of what is done in that university. And so that's existed before, uh, uh, before uh, which in 1866, yeah, I, I, uh, and, uh, Mm, but but that time that was new journal and again that if you look into the context first European journal or at least what German sources say it's a uh, uh, journal für die Reine und Gewandte Mathematik or so-called Kremi journal was uh, 1826 founded and uh, again soon became very important still uh, exist a mathematician Annalen, which uh, followed. So you see again, this uh, Russian journal was somehow in the stream. And here I just, uh, yeah, and it was actually related to creation of Moscow Mathematical Society, again, still working. And this is a, this is a just one article of uh, statutes of this uh, society. And uh, I just mentioned it because it says that uh, all, uh, say, talks and uh, published materials uh, coming from members of the society should be in Russian. So that was a check. Unless then there is some reservation for, say, members by correspondence and some other people who don't know Russian. So after all, they, they uh, accepted some stuff known in Russian. We've just seen that. Kalmagorov and Hinchin later published in this uh, Zbornik, which was the journal of the society, right? And still is. Uh, uh, so somehow they did not respect this uh, status. I, I don't know exactly, perhaps today they have a new status uh, and it's uh, no longer in force. But, but anyway, we see that yes, this choice for Russian language was quite uh, explicit and I don't think again that it was somewhat unusual. Of course, this uh, German journals, they, they publish in German, French in French and in America in English, uh, not otherwise. So in that sense, they are just uh, the, of course it was all, at least uh, if we talk about 18th century kind of imperial enterprise, right? How are you built in the empire? That is exactly what Peter the Great tried to do and uh, uh, building Academy of Science with, uh, Publishing side was just part of this, all right? So, right, and uh, that, that's very interesting. I promised about this. This is, this is a first specialized mathematical journal, perhaps first again uh, Polish mathematical journal. I, that, that's I didn't look into. Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, I forgot. Uh, it was uh, founded by Zygmunt, and I can can see my own name, which I don't know by by heart. But anyway, it's interesting because the uh, linguistic policy here was different, right? So they did allow many languages, and actually, that's how Kalmagorov would publish there in French. Luzin also published there, so certainly it was made by kind of patriotic people. You see here. It's uh, volume five, Stanislav Lesnevsky, Jan Lukasevich, all very uh, important names, Vaslov Sierpinski, Stefan Mazurkevich is less known today. But anyway, uh, yeah, that's likely, by the way, the volume where Kalmagorov published, right, in uh, 1924. Mm, so it was a kind of new enterprise for the time, and that's somehow was explains why uh, also Kalmagorov could be interested, I guess, with the promotion with uh, his professor, uh, Nikolai Luzin, of course, right? Otherwise, uh, I don't think that he, he just seen an announcement and sent there his paper that was somehow with uh, advice of, uh, of Luzin. But anyway, I, uh, coming back to the story, why he first published in foreign languages then in Russia, I guess that 
publishing in uh, the Zbornik was more difficult only for the fact that that was just the only Russian journal, right? That you had to become first member of uh, uh, this Moscow Mathematical Society, right? So for younger students, probably these places were kind of more accessible even. And uh, if we're talking about uh, German journals, right? Like Annalen, uh, then also it was kind of more like modern journals. So they had already some flow of incoming papers, right? Uh, and uh, Again, uh, particular circumstances needs to be looked up more precisely, but I can imagine that it still might work more like we imagine that today that you send their paper, it's accepted, right? Uh, while this Bornik, I think, was, was really kind of a, a club, more or less, not completely closed, but just to enter the club, you need to already make mathematical career. Right, you couldn't just uh, publish uh, immediately. So again, that shows that this model of uh, Sokolov and Titov, of course it reflects today's realities, but not realities of the time. And that's, I, I, I just amazed by the fact that the journal was founded the same year that actually, uh, that, uh, uh, Polish people called uh, Vyprava Kievska, uh, Kiev Offensive. So it was a uh, it was a peak of uh, Soviet Polish war, where uh, where uh, Polish army with uh, Pilsudski and Pitlura they actually took uh, Kiev uh, in May of 1920, and then. They were pushed back by Soviet. Of course, Ukrainian people was how somehow divided between these two forces and uh, fought on two sides. And as you see, that very much connects uh, to today's uh, tragic uh, circumstances. And um, I don't know exactly what kind of moral I can draw, but probably one moral is that you see this, uh, if we just think what, kind of institution founded at that time are valuable, right? And still, and I think say this journal is one of these, okay? A again, it's, you see, it survived through this uh, Soviet occupation, uh, through everything. And the same mathematical warning who survived the revolution and survived Soviet time. And even if it's today not so important a journal, but anyway, I, th I think there is a particular value in this uh, old academic institution, even if, of course, to survive, they need to be reformed. Uh, I don't mean at least at all to keep them as they, but the other way around, to, uh, to make them work, they, they, they need to be reformed, but reform rather than just cancel. And I think I now just come to my uh, conclusions. So that's first conclusion that academic institutions like academies, uh, society in general, they are look to be more stable than associated political regimes and have a capacity to survive through very drastic political regime changes. And these imperial colonial models uh, proposed by Sokolov and Titaev does not really account for the real complexity of the academic institution building, even in time of great empires. One very simple fact is that normally these empires are many. It's not just one empire, right? Several empires and uh, kind of uh, competing uh, academic building also uh, uh, in these empires rather than just one empire in periphery, it's what they uh, they suggest. Uh, so this model, I don't think, I think it's hardly deserves to be endured and somehow reinforced and more so under the appearance of say progressive reform. And that's what is done uh, or was done in uh, high school of economic in Russia. Now it may be more on this uh, after beginning of the war on uh, this uh, native or original side, right? So, so my, my basic point is it just uh, kind of false dilemma between these things. And of course, we just need to, to avoid this imperial infrastructure first rather than making this uh, artificial 
uh, choice between being a good uh, colonial workers and kind of uh, not even rebellions, but trying kind of isolationist, right? Uh, it, it just very wrong. But on the other hand, yeah, it's what I already said, this old institution, such as traditional academies of science, however, they look outdated today very often, but I do believe they deserve preservation and of course, continue reforms, but kind of careful reforms, right? Not just by saying it's all outdated, let's uh, build new scientific institutions, uh, uh, whatever impact factors and so on, all right? And uh, now I'm going to say something which is probably just like uh, knocking open door, but maybe also uh, polemical. Yeah, so I really would like to, to, to get reaction. Uh, so I believe that construal of multiple regional sciences, it's, it's my term, my responsibility for this term, like Russian or Soviet science, Ukrainian science, Chinese science, whatever you may have right in this kind of research. Uh, so when this regional science are kind of construed, right, or reflected, studied by the assumed scientific metropole. So like we are sitting in MIT, right, just saying how it's Russian sciences, how Chinese science is. And I think it's a wrong way to decolonize scientific institution. If we're really serious about this decolonization, and I think it's a, it's a appropriate goal, and then we should do really something else. And uh, just, uh, I finish, uh, okay, a kind of philosophical points and saying that science rationality and what this uh, people of enlightenment called uh, in France, la république des lettres, this is just one thing, right? And it cannot be monopolized by any particular institution or community, so some metropole, scientific metropole, or any colony, right? It, it's uh, just idea that uh, communication is ideally universal. And how we make it work out in practice is of course a very different question. And so this concept that trying to construe say Russian science or Soviet science, Chinese science, uh, as a something specific, right? No, not just as a science in general, but something like in itself. I think it basically shows the reinforcement of this imperial colonial discourse in academic matters. And the serious and attentive history of science, which of course is needed, right? And, uh, and indeed it should cover more areas that it covered so far. We indeed need more um, attention, say to Chinese science, to everything that was not sufficiently covered so far, uh, but it doesn't need it at all. Uh, and here I just uh, draw on Karl Popper's paper, which he called Myth of Framework, which is kind of against Thomas Kuhn. But it, okay, I will not develop it here, maybe in question time. So a study of history of science in Russia and in the Soviet Union does not require the concept of Russian science and Soviet science, of course, linguistically, we, we, we can use it, but I think we should not, we should be kind of careful with this kind of uh, concept. Uh, uh, okay, thank you.